Thanks for downloading the Cross Defense Podcast. I'm glad, oh, man, am I glad you're uh, here as part of the podcasting family. It's really fantastic. Today's show is all about hope, about how the devil attacks our hope, about how the Lord promises us, and our hope is based on his promises. It has strength in its object. Hope you enjoy, and you'll find something helpful in here for you, for your family, for your friends. You'll share it around. And let me know what you think. Wolfmuller.co slash hope has all the notes. God's peace be with you. Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, your host here on Cross Defense. Ian's producing over there. Just me and Ian, just the two of us, making the show happen. We're talking about hope. Oh, oh, so here's the question. Here's the opening question for you, by the way. How is your hope? I, I want to I wanna set this up a little bit. We're going to try to talk about hope all day today because I've been, you know, I'm a pastor. He's kicking around, talking to people, talking about Jesus and the Bible with people in the church and outside of the church. And one of the things that I've noticed in the past couple of years, maybe it's gone on longer than that. I just didn't notice it. But it seems like hope, our Christian hope is under attack. It seems to me like there's there's a dearth of hopefulness. It seems to me like like Christians are not marked by hope. If I was to ask you just to describe the Christians that you see around you, the the Christians that you interact with, just describe what what marks them, what makes them, what what causes them to tick. I think there's a couple of ways that the Bible describes the Christian and that we live that are different from one another. One of the ways is joy, this is related, it's joy. You know, the Bible describes the Christian as those who are full of joy, that we have these joyful lives. If you think of your normal, average, everyday walking around or watching the news Christian today, you see they're not, they're not full of joy. They're, they kind of, they've, they've believed the devil's lie that to be serious is to be joyless. Now, that's, this is important. This is a falsehood that the devil puts on us, on you and on me. He says, if you want to, if you want to be serious, you have to have no joy at all. In fact, we, we think that joy and even happiness it, equates to flippancy. That's not the way the Bible thinks about things. I mean, who was more joyful than Jesus after the resurrection? And who was more serious than Jesus after the resurrection? So we can't, we have to resist the, this this attack on joy, but so also, I think, and it's related, is the devil's attack on hope. Now look, at the Bible describes the Christians as those who hope in God. This is over and over in the Psalms. I got a list here. I printed out a bunch of pages, Ian. You should be proud of me, all this work I did for the short of days. I don't even think we're going to get to all this stuff on hope. In the Bible, there's so much on hope in the Bible. It's incredible. But here's one. that the, the Psalms describe the Christian as those who hope in God. Psalm 69, Psalm 22, verse 5, Psalm 25, verse 2, Psalm 25, verse 20, amongst others. If you missed them, you're going to have to listen to the podcast. The, those who... Those who hope in God, that's almost a definition of the Christian. Or how about this? This is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, where Peter writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In other words, Christians are the hopers. <laughs> I don't think that's a real word, but it's, it's, it's so fundamental to our Christian character that we are those who hope in God that the Bible almost uses it to define us. Now, this is different. This is very different than the, than the way that the, the world thinks. For example, there's a an outline of the virtue that the old pagans had. Remember, they had uh, courage and justice and wisdom and what's the balancing thing? Prudence. Those are the those are the four cardinal virtues that the that the heathen had. In fact, the heathen uh, will, will speak very little about the idea of hope because the because there's no way to do it. 
Now, now, th- now think about this. We, we, we Christians are so used to hearing about hope that we think that hope would be for everybody. But the Bible describes what is one of the marks of the pagan mind that it's a mind without hope. <laughs> I've got those. I've got those scriptures somewhere here too. Uh, let me find it for you. It says, for example, Paul says, "We don't want you to mourn like those who have no hope." That's in First Thessalonians. Or, or here, this is Paul writing in Ephesians two. It says that remember you were at that time separated from Christ. This is before you were a Christian. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope. And without God in the world, so one of the ways that the that the that the pagan mind is separated from the Christian mind is that it has no hope. It, at least it has no hope for itself. I mean, maybe the maybe the pagan secular godless thinker can think that there's hope for humanity or hope for the world or hope for SpaceX or whatever, who knows, but there's no hope for the individual because there's no resurrection, there's no soul, there's no life after death, there's no heaven, there's no God who sits on the throne to make things right. Now, I came across this very interesting paragraph, digging into hope from, I'm not sure where this is from, I should have probably wrote this down, but this talks about this idea of secular hope versus biblical hope. Here's what it says. Very natural, very naturally, such hope, that is secular hope, even when it appears to be justified, is transient and illusory. And it's remarkable how often it's qualified by the pagan poets and other writers by such epithets as faint, trembling, feeble, desperate, or phantom. That's, that, that, that's what the pagan way of talking about hope is. It's not certain. It's, it's this kind of this wish it it comes along with this with this idea of of doubt uh, i'm learning i'm the pastor now of st paul lutheran church in austin texas and the pastor of jesus deaf lutheran church also in austin texas and to pastor of that congregation i'm beginning just starting to learn sign language and it's interesting what the difference it, it, it sign American Sign Language is apparently, I'm learning, a very secular language, much more secular than English, which has all these sort of Christian's allusions to it. And one of the problems is when they're translating from, from say, English into ASL, they run into these things, and, and the word hope is one of them. The classic ASL sign for hope is you cross your fingers and you kind of wag them back and forth a little bit. Like, I've got my fingers crossed. I I, I wish this this would happen in the future but i'm pretty sure it's not going to i hope i'll win the lottery i hope i won't get sick from the chinese food i hope the rockies will win the the world series or whatever you but you but you're pretty sure it's not going to happen so you've got your fingers crossed that's the secular idea of hope i've got this vague idea of what a good future would look like but i'm pretty sure that's not what the future is going to be but that's not what the biblical idea of hope is. So that in the church, they've had to invent a different sign for hope, which is kind of you put your hands up and bend your fingers over and move your fingers up and down. I'm not sure exactly why, but the point is you have to... The biblical word for hope is a completely different idea than the secular word for hope. Here's what this article continues to say. The Bible sometimes uses hope in this conventional sense. The plowman, for example, should plow in hope, 1 Corinthians 9, for it's the hope of reward that sweetens the labor. But for the most part, the hope with which the Bible is concerned is something very different. And in comparison with it, other hope is scarcely recognized as hope. The majority of secular thinkers in the ancient world did not regard hope as a virtue but merely as a temporary illusion. And Paul was giving an accurate description of pagans when he said that they had no hope. Ephesians 2, 1 Thessalonians 4, the verses we mentioned. The fundamental reason for this being that they were without God. Now this is an amazing, an amazing thing for us to realize. I mean, just as Christians, for us to think about. The very fact that we have the possibility of hope of us of a certain future that we can fix our imagination and our hearts around 
is a gift that God gives us in his word. Now, we're going to try to look at the anatomy of hope, and most especially, I think we're going to look at how the devil is attacking our hope, why he attacks our hope, and how the Lord defends us from this attack. That's We're going to try to wander around a bunch of those topics, but I think it's it's so important for us to begin simply with this recognition that that hope is only possible for those who believe that there is a God, that that God is good, that that God is strong, and that that God gives promises. That there is a God who is good and who's strong and who gives promises. If you don't have any of those things, you cannot have hope. At least you cannot have any certainty of something good that is to come. This article, we'll talk about this more, don't worry, but this article continues. There, where there is a belief in the living God who acts and intervenes in human life and who can be trusted to implement his promises, hope in the specifically biblical sense becomes possible. Such hope is not a matter of temperament, nor is it conditioned by prevailing circumstances or any human possibilities. It does not depend upon what man possesses, upon what he may be able to do for himself, or upon what any other human being may do for him. There was, for example, nothing in the situation in which Abraham found himself to justify his hope that Sarah would give birth to a son, but because he believed in God, he could hope, he could in hope, believe against hope. Romans 4.18, we'll have to talk about that text. Biblical hope is inseparable, therefore, from faith in God. If you don't have God, you don't have hope. Now, I hope, you're, I hope you're tracking with me. I'm going to take a step back, and then we'll kind of launch at this from another direction. Because one of the things that I think is true, and you guys, if you if you think I'm not seeing this right, I'd love to hear from you. By the way, the best way to do that is to contact me through the website, wolfmuller.co slash contact, I think. Or just if you go to wolfmuller.co, you'll see a little button at the top that says contact, and you can fill out the form. That actually just it, it sends me an email, and I get it. I get these. You guys are sending me questions all the time, and response. It's fantastic. I love it. So if you go to wolfmuller.co, you'll also see, by the way, when you're there, don't like get too distracted, but you'll see that um, that a new book that Concordia Publishing House is going to publish in August is there, ready to be pre-purchased. A Martyr's Faith for a Faithless World. That's kind of cool. So you can see the picture. you got the cover with, with Michael coming down, crushing the dragon. They did a great job on that cover design, and, and that book will be out. That, I wrote that book for my daughter Hannah, who's going to go to college in August, so she can read it. And it's it's about how the devil attacks our our faith and our hope and our love. We'll we'll talk about some of this stuff uh, on the show uh, further. But if you go to there, you can let me know what you think because I I am convinced more and more that that our culture is an Epicurean culture. That is the the creed of the culture is the creed of the Epicureans, which says, "Eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow you will die." But there's a theological underpinning to Epicureanism, and it is this. It's two negations. Epicureanism is based on the negation that God intervenes in the world and that there is an afterlife. That, that is the foundation, the theological foundation of Epicureanism. That God, the Epicurean says that, well, there might be gods or a god or something out there, but that thing, whatever it is, does not interfere with this life, nor does it judge us when we die. Epicurus, in fact, said this because, remember, Epicurus said that the goal of life is to have the least amount of trouble, and the thing that troubles us most is the idea that God can intervene and that we will be judged. And so... To get rid of that trouble, we just have to deny them. We deny that God intervenes, and we deny that there'll be judgment on the afterlife. And this, these two things, that God intervenes in this world, and that there will be a judgment on the last day, is the basis for our Christian hope. Now, now think about this. If it's true, as I'm suggesting to you, that hope is based on the fact that that God is good, that God is strong, and that God has made promises. And Epicureanism denies all of those things, and our culture is based on Epicureanism, then we live in a culture that has as its root, as its understanding of reality, a denial of hope. <laughs> so, so it's no wonder. It's no, it's no wonder when we look around that hope is so hard to see. That hope is so hard to recognize. It's so hope is so 
hard to come by. If anybody is around who is hoping, it's because they're on the momentum of our Christian doctrine. It's on the momentum of this Christian world. There's there's nothing in the secular worldview, and particularly in Epicureanism, there's nothing there to give any to give anything any support or any any reason or any rationale for hope. So hope is one of the things that makes our Christian thinking and our Christian mind different. Now, how different and why does it look different and how does the devil attack it? Those are some of the things we want to take up. But let's take a break. Ian's given me the signal, so we're going to go to break here. It will be a short one. You can hope that we'll be back soon, and, uh, and we'll see you on the other side. You listen to Cross Events. I'm Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, pastor of, of St. Paul Lutheran Church and Jesus Deaf Lutheran Church in Austin, Texas. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. This is the day which the Lord has made. For the lonely and homebound, for the grieving and dying, and for all those who are afflicted in body, mind, and spirit, especially for me. Join us for a live broadcast of Chapel at the LCMS International Center weekdays at 10 a.m. on KFUO. This week on Issues Etc., we'll discuss marriage equality with Dr. Ryan Anderson. We'll find out from Dr. Jennifer Roback Morse what Jeffrey Epstein, Harvey Weinstein, and Theodore McCarrick have in common. And we'll continue our series on the Lutheran Confessions, talking with Pastor Paul McCain about Christian questions with their answers from Luther's small catechism. Issues Etc., live weekday afternoons from 3 to 5 on KFUO. You're a miracle. You know that, right? A living, breathing, one-of-a-kind miracle. You were created to stand apart, to share your gifts in the service of others, to make an uncommon impact in a common world. And at Concordia University, it's our mission to help you do that, to live uncommon. To learn more about Concordia, go to cuw.edu. In a day when numerous concerns about money and safety abound in this fallen world, there is still a beacon of hope in Christ Jesus spreading the gospel message of mercy. Worldwide, KFUO has been a good steward of donations, ensuring the safety of funds our listener-supported ministry receives. If you have questions about donating to keep this worldwide ministry healthy, send an email to gifts at kfuo.org. Hey, Crutchfits, we're talking about hope. <laughs> we were reading this Sunday. We were reading, I'm Pastor Brian Wolf, by the way. You're listening to Cross Defense. We're talking about, I think I said that already. We're talking about hope. We had Colossians chapter 1, where Paul is praying. He says, I always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Now, these three, faith, love, and hope, almost always go together. It's it's fascinating to see. Now, we normally think, oh, hey, Pastor Wolfmuller, you got it wrong. In fact, Paul probably got it wrong. He put him in the wrong order. Don't you know it's faith, hope, and love? That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. But, but probably the right order, the way it normally shows up, is faith, love, and hope. These three, like this. And, and there's a logical order to that. There's a, there's a priority or a... Um, a way that the Lord's word sort of manifests in these ways. The first is, is the scripture shows us our sin, and, and then it shows us Christ, and the result is faith and his promises and a righteousness that comes to us as an alien work of God. And then as we are set free from the bondage of sin, we begin to love God and serve our neighbor. And then as we do that, we're attacked and and we suffer in this fallen world. And so the attack comes next on hope, and the Lord is wanna, wants to strengthen our hope. In fact, I think if you if you look carefully at a lot of St. Paul's writings, they follow that order. 
faith. He talks about the doctrine and the attack on doctrine by false doctrine. And then love, how we're to live our Christian life in service to the neighbor and in love for God. And then hope, how we're to endure persecution. Now, if this is what the Lord is giving and the way the Lord is working, then it makes sense that this is also the way the devil is attacking us. And I think I remember hearing Dr. Kleinig talk about this, that the devil has a front door attack and a back door attack. And I think when we consider hope, we can expand it and say he's got a side window attack. So the devil's coming after us. And this is what he does. The world, the flesh, and the devil. They come after us. And the first attack is is to go through the front door to, to tempt us to sin and especially to tempt us to disbelief, to unbelief, to, to believe false doctrine, to not trust the Lord and his word, to think that God lies and that he's given us lies or whatever. So that's that's first attack. And oftentimes, that, I mean, that works, but sometimes it doesn't. And so then the devil goes around the back door and tries to sneak in the back, and that's when he attacks our love, he tries to get us to, we are not sinning against God, we're going to sin against one another. One of the chief ways the devil does gets us to sin against each other is, is through anger. Oh man, we were talking about this. We were talking about this on the YouTube yesterday uh, about how the devil's backdoor attack on he gets someone to sin against us. You know how this goes: someone sins against you, and then you get all bent out of shape, and you say, "Look, that I know Jesus said love my neighbor, but but that guy that guy doesn't count." He, I, don't, I don't have to love him. Look what he did to me. Look at how he hurt me or whatever. Now someone sins against me and I sin against them and I don't even feel bad about it because I hate them or whatever. And that, now the devil's got us, he's got us going down that track. That's the attack on love. But then there's a third attack. This is where the devil sneaks around the side and he tries to break in through the bathroom window. And this is the attack on hope. So it's, and, and it happens chiefly, I think, through suffering. What 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 I want to maybe ask you this question. What do you think that the world is trying to teach you about hope? And what do you think your flesh is trying to teach you about hope? And and what do you think the devil is trying to teach you about hope? I mean I I think I I'll just guess for me, you know, the world you just you watch the news. You read the news. I subscribe to the newspaper. I might be the only person subscribed to the newspaper here in Austin, Texas. It's amazing. Just print it right in front of me. <laughs> subscribe to the news, and, and I look at the news, and I think, what are these guys trying to tell me? What are they trying to teach me? They're, they're not teaching me to hope. They're, they're teaching me to despair. They're, they're teach the, the world is teaching me that things are bad and getting worse that we're right on the brink of destruction, that one long, one wrong bat of President Trump's eyelashes and North Korea is going to send over the armies and, and Iran is going to blow the place up and, and, and the economy is going to plummet and who knows what. I mean, the, the world wants us to have no hope. Things are, this is how, things are bad and getting worse. You know, it's one of the marks of the old people. This probably didn't count. I'm not talking about you. Don't worry. One of the marks of the old people is that their imagination, their nostalgia has, has captured the past in such glorious terms that it seems like things are only always getting worse, that things are so much worse now than they ever were. And the old people will tell you that when they were young, that's exactly what the old people thought then. And if we could talk to those old people, we would say this is the same thing. Then it's all, it seems like it's always getting worse. It's because the world is always attacking our hope, and so is our flesh. I mean, what is your flesh preaching to you about hope? <laughs> I broke my toe the other day. It's a glorious day. I dropped a TV on it. I didn't want to go to the doctor, but Carrie made. I was <laughs> such a big baby. Carrie made me go to the, you know, the little little mini hospital place or whatever so they did an x-ray on my toe and they told me that i broke my toe in one spot and i fractured it in two others and i said good and the guy said good you're happy about that and i said yeah because i would really be embarrassed if i walked over here and and you x-rayed my toe and you said well it's just bruised this is texas what are you doing limping so i'm glad i'm glad i had a real reason to go to the doctor 
But my toe has been preaching to me every day now for three weeks, and apparently it takes six weeks for a big toe to heal. It's ridiculous. And that and that's longer as you get older. And, and my toe is preaching to me that this body's wasting away. This is the this is the preaching of our flesh. It doesn't preach hope. It's not like, you know, it's not like you wake up one day and you and there's and there's less wrinkles. Or you just, as you get older, you get more and more toned and quicker and quicker and faster and faster and and getting up is easier and easier every day. This is not, this is not what your body preaches. Your body, your body is preaching to you that every day you're just a little bit closer to death. Now it's this. Does this sound gruesome? I don't know, but we gotta we gotta pay attention to the things that are preaching to us because they want to influence us, and and the world is preaching to us about hope, and the and the flesh is preaching about hope, and the devil preaches to us about hope. I mean, do you tell do you, do you recognize this that the devil says, "Look, what do you do? What are you doing? Hoping in God? Today is just the same as yesterday. Yesterday is just the same as the day before. The day before is just the same as the day before that, and tomorrow is going to be just like today." You you have hope for what? Hope for justice? There's no justice. Hope for faith? There's no faith. You see, the church is shrinking, that, that there's more and more people who don't believe in anything, that the world's becoming more and more secular, more and more pagan, that less and less people go to church, that your kids and your family, the people that you love go to church. You might mention Jesus to your neighbors and you get mocked for it. The devil's telling you all these things. You say, what do you, what do you have reason for hope for? You need to give up hope. You should abandon all hope. This is how the devil preaches. This is what. So the world, the flesh, and the devil are constantly trying to attack our hope, and especially in the midst of suffering. I mean, when we're hurted or hurted, <laughs> when we're hurt, or when we're wounded, when we're sinned against, when we're in the midst of affliction, physical affliction, spiritual affliction, whatever. They, they, this is all the devil's attack on hope because the devil doesn't want us to, to walk around in hope. And why? And why? We, we the, the hope is what, is, what, is what gives us spiritual life. There's a text... Oh, let's see. It's Paul is writing again, and he talks about how our hope is a helmet. Our hope protects us. Now, nothing, our, our hope protects our head. If you are hoping, then you are thinking rightly. If you are hoping in God and trusting that he'll keep his promises. But if you're not hoping, you are off of your head. You're out of your head. You 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 are you are spiritually mentally ill if you lack hope. Now I'm preaching to myself when I say this. So, First Thessalonians five eight says, "But since we belong to the day and not to the night, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation." Do you see that? So that as we guard our minds with hope, we begin to see things rightly. We begin to recognize that things are not perfect. Things are not as they're supposed to be, but that they will be. That we, we, that we are not wandering around aimlessly in the world, but that the, but that the history of the world is pressing s somewhere. It's going somewhere. It's being led to a culmination, a culmination of glory when Jesus himself will come back and we will see it and we will rejoice in it. So we live with hope. I want to, I want to put another text before you. It's Psalm 33, verses 17 to 22. It's kind of a long section of this particular psalm, but it has to do with the false hope of the world versus the true hope of the Christian. Oh, here's the text. Psalm 33, verse 17. The war horse is a false hope for salvation. In fact, I've got a whole list of things that you're not supposed to hope in here. I'll, I'll read this. This is from another little thing we printed out. The corollary of putting one ho one's hope in God is refusing to place one's final confidence in anything that belongs to the created order. All created things are weak, transient, and apt to fail. For this reason, it's futile to vest ultimate hope in wealth, 
Psalm 49, verse 6, Psalm 52, 7, Proverbs 11, etc. In houses, Isaiah 32. In princes, Psalm 146. In empires and armies, Isaiah 31. Or even in the Jerusalem temple, Jeremiah 7. These are all wrong things to put our hope in. In fact, the strength of hope is in the object of hope. Like faith. Faith doesn't save because it's faith. Faith saves because it's in Christ. So hope that doesn't disappoint is not just hope. You just can't hope in anything. Hope in whatever, yourself or your works or your wealth or your talent. You can't put your hope in these things, in your president or your king or your armies. Or Hope is hope doesn't disappoint because it has the right object. It, 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 it's, its object is God. Remember, remember the story of the guy, the two guys that were crossing the frozen river. This is, this has to do with faith and the object. Remember, the, the two guys came to a river and they're gonna they're gonna go across it and and uh, and it's covered in ice and and one guy has very very little faith in the ice to hold him up, and the other guy has this kind of audacious, bold, bold faith in the ice. So one guy, the guy with bold faith, he gets on a on a snowmobile and he just plunges across this ice river. <laughs> The other guy with very timid faith kind of shimmies across on his belly inch by inch thinking that the whole time he's going to die. But what's the moral of the story is they both make it across because the river's frozen solid. And they come back two weeks later, the same sort of thing, the guy with the audacious faith and the guy with very, very little faith, and they both use the same strategy. The bold faith plunges across and the, and the, and the weak faith shimmies across and both sink because the, glass, the, because the ice was like a pane of glass. It was just thin. That's a, in other words, the strength of your faith doesn't matter. What matters is the object of your faith, and hope is the same way. You put your hope in, what's this list say? Houses and wealth and empires and armies and princes and, and the temple or Jerusalem or anything else, then your hope will fail. But if you put your hope in God, who is the rock that cannot be moved, he's a refuge and a fortress, he provides the ultimate security, he makes our hope established. Our hope stands. So back to Psalm 33. A war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by it great might, by its great might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love. Now how about that text? That the Lord, the Lord who does the Lord have his eye on? It tells us right here. The Lord has his eye on those who fear him and those who hope in his love. I mean, how? Text continues. That he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Verse 22. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. So the Christian has hope in God. The Christian has hope in the Lord who is good and who is strong and who makes promises. This is, the eyes of the Lord are on those who hope in him. Wow. I mean, here, I think, I think the devil has tricked us so bad that we, we are almost in, like, well, I don't want to hope. Like, like hope is sort of, uh, like hope is being braggy. You know, like, so we have this kind of false humility. Like, if I'm too hopeful, I won't be humble like I'm supposed to be. No, we're supposed to be abounding in hope. Where's that verse? Abounding in hope. Blessed hope, have no hope, Christ in you, hope of glory, hope of resurrection of the dead. I think it's in Romans. How come I can't find it? That we're supposed to be, we're, that we abound in, can you imagine that? That, that? that the Christian is supposed to, aha, it is Romans. Romans 15 Oh, this is a good text. Romans fifteen twelve to 13. Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. And then listen to this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. <laughs> have you, got, you have so much hope you don't even know what to do with it all. I got enough hope for me. 
and for you over there, and when I run out and someone comes over, sorry to be... No, I got plenty of hope. There's enough to go around. It's overflowing around here. I got I have hope upon hope upon hope because I know that God is good and God is, and God is strong and God makes promises. Now here as we go to the break, I want to kind of divide that up. This is kind of a dissection of hope. I'm going to read you a little paragraph here. The ground act and object of hope. Here, here this guy writes, it's helpful to distinguish among the basis of hope, the object of hope, and the activity of hoping. In both Hebrew and Greek, the noun forms tend to express the ground or the basis of hope by the reason of which one hopes. And this is not the same as the immediate object of hope. The objects are sometimes specified, especially in passages where eschatological concerns are the focus, but the frequent omission of an apparent object suggests that the ground or guarantee of hope is the decisive factor. The verb forms, on the other hand, emphasize the human response, the activity, or the attitude, or the foundation of hope. Now, we'll dig into that a little bit more, but we want to say that hope has a source or a foundation, and hope has an object or a goal, and so hope is more than just the activity of hoping, of longing, and of trusting, but that hope is built on something and presses towards something. It's built on the fact that God is, that God is good, and that God is strong, that he can make things happen, this anti-Epicurean business, and it presses towards the fact that God has promised, and specifically that he's promised to return for us. That's what we'll talk about on the other side of the break. You're listening to Cross Fence. I'm Pastor Brian Wolf Miller. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. That is our hope. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. The prophet Isaiah chapter 55 verses 10 and 11. Begin and conclude your day with the word that accomplishes the purposes for which it is sent. Morning prayer at 7 a.m. and evening prayer at 5 p.m. Weekdays on KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere. The broadcasts of morning prayer and evening prayer are underwritten by Lutherans for Life. Michelangelo, Da Vinci, and Rembrandt are the names that come to mind when you imagine great art depicting biblical scenes. But breathtaking works inspired by the Bible are still being created today. Egbert Moderman, a contemporary artist from the Netherlands, currently has three original paintings on display at Museum of the Bible, titled The Good Samaritan, also called Compassion, Ruth and Boaz, and Simon of Cyrene. In a 2017 interview, Moderman explained how the biblical narrative inspires his work. He said, these stories describe the human nature in all her simplicity, complexity, and drama. I try to portray these human emotions in my work. My style can be described as figurative with a dramatic and religious flair. Engage with the Bible and its impact on history, culture, and art. Brought to you by Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. We got a lot of notes for this show. You're listening to Cross Events, by the way, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, your host, pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church and Jesus Deaf Lutheran Church, Austin, Texas. Come by and visit sometime. We got a lot of notes on the show, and so I'm right now, even as we speak, adding a post on the blog. So I think if you go to wolfmuller.co slash hope you'll see all the scripture texts that we're talking about and a few of the Bible, a few of the passages that I uh, read as well we were talking about the ground and act and object of hope basically the idea that when we think of hope we think of the activity of hoping but remember hope is based on the object it sits it rests in the fact that God is that God is good and that God is strong or God is powerful that he is able to do what he has promised so that hope has an object our 
hope is in Christ. And and if you don't have these things, if you don't have the, um, if you don't have the truth that uh, that God is and the truth that God makes promises, then you don't have, you don't have hope. Here's here's how Paul says this. This is Titus one. Titus one one. In fact. Paul writes, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. So do you hear that? So that our hope of eternal life is based, is built upon the fact that God, who is and who doesn't lie, gave us the promise you, you got to have those three things God has to be it has to be maybe it's four things God has to be God has to be good God has to be strong another good in other words trustworthy he has to be strong and he has to give us promises if he hasn't given us a promise then we have nothing to hope in but he has given us promises here's another verse Hebrews chapter 6 Starting with verse 18, it says, So that by two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, this is one of my most favorite passages because the picture that it puts before us, you got to, okay, you're imagining there, close your eyes unless you're driving, then leave them open. But imagine this. Imagine that you're on a boat. This is how it goes in the in the ancient. I suppose it goes this way now too. You're on a boat, and when you get to the shore, there's one person who goes on shore, and they bring the rope on with them, and they tie off the boat so it doesn't go anywhere. That one person might have to jump off, and they jump even into the water, and they go up the coast, and maybe they'll they'll tie it to a tree or something like this. But say the boat has an anchor, they'll jump off and they'll grab the anchor, and they'll carry the anchor with them where they go, and they'll put the anchor down on the ground. Now, that's the picture that Hebrews is painting for us, and it's saying we're all in the boat, the boat of the Christian church, and we've got to the shore, and Jesus has jumped off, and he's taken the anchor, which is why the anchor is the ancient symbol for hope. He takes the anchor, and he's carried it ashore. But then, this is so great, Hebrews adds this picture to it because it says that right on the shore, you have to imagine that right on the shore is the temple in Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is nowhere near the coast. So it's way up on the mountains. In fact, there's not even a river in Jerusalem. So it's, a, it's imaginative language that Hebrews has given it to us. But you've got to imagine that the tabernacle is right on the edge of the... And Jesus carries the anchor, and he carries it into the, into the temple, into the holy place, into the holy of holies, and he ties the rope around the Ark of the Covenant... You see the picture? Now, we're still floating in the boat, in the waves and the storms and everything else. But we're latched to the throne of God in heaven. <laughs> if you can, can you imagine this? I want you to do this. Next time, next time you go to church, should be Sunday, by the way. Next time you go to church, I want you to imagine that your soul has a rope tied around it. And that rope goes goes out of your heart straight through the altar in front of you and it reaches all the way up to the throne of God in heaven and Jesus has tied it around the foot of the throne of God in heaven. That's the picture that Hebrews has given to us. Look what it says. It says, By two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, and we have fled for refuge, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. 
Do you know there's a story? I don't know if this is true or not. People tell the story about how the priests in the Old Testament, you know, they'd go into the Holy of Holies once a year. Well, they'd go twice a year on one day, the Day of Atonement. They'd take two trips into this place, the Holy of Holies. And they would wear bells on their fringes because they were worried that if they fell over dead, what are you going to do? No one else is supposed to be able to go in there except for the high priest. And so, so one of the stories is that they would tie a rope around their foot. Now, again, I don't know if this is true or not, but... I, the idea is they'd they tie a rope around their foot so that if the guys fell over dead in the Holy of Holies, they could pull them out with this rope and pull their dead bodies out. Well, Hebrews is giving us the exact opposite picture. Jesus has gone into the throne room of God, and there was he's got a rope, and, and we're not pulling him down. He's pulling us up. So that every time we go to church, Jesus, who's in the throne of God, is pulling on the rope and reeling us in right to the to the to the altar. When you when you go into the church and then and then you come up for the Lord's supper, He's pulling you all the way up to the altar and giving you His body and His blood, and then He lets it loose a little bit and He He gives you a little slack and you go home and you go about your business. And on Sunday, He pulls you back up and He pulls you up to the altar. He's got you and He gives you what you need, the forgiveness of sins. Then He gives you a little slack and off you go. And one day, Jesus is just going to keep pulling. He's not going to stop. He's just going to pull and pull and pull until whoop, he pulls your soul right out of this earth and pulls you all the way to himself in heaven. That's the picture. That's our hope. That is glorious. You're, you're, you are roped. You are lashed. You are anchored. You are bound up to the throne where Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. You, who you're listening to me, by your baptism, by your faith in Christ, by the word of God, you are latched to this. And this is your hope. <laughs> this is your life. You don't see it. So is this faith that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the, the confidence of things not seen. This is what it means to have hope. You don't see it yet. This is what uh, how, how Paul talks about hope. This is Romans chapter chapter 8, verse 24. In this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? You have it already. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. And this is our life, waiting for this great gift with patience. Ab ab abounding and overflowing and rejoicing in, in this, this hope. Now, it's tough. I mean, it's tough because we don't see it. And we, we always want to trust what we see. Why, why? I don't know. I mean, I have not figured this out. I mean, it's me too. I mean, I'm preaching to me, not not so much to you guys. But, you know, we, we have this idea that seeing is believing. I'll believe it if I see it, that kind of thing. And so we think that that if we don't see it, it's not real. But we, we the Scriptures give us a different idea. I mean, our hope is what is real. It's what's established. It's what's it's what stands even even when we can't see it. We we walk by faith and not and not by sight. We walk by hope. And not by sight. And this is this is why Abraham is our example. Now, this takes us back to this text that we were talking about right at the very beginning, Romans chapter 4, which says, talking about Abraham, in hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As, he'd been, t as he's been told, so shall your seed be. Now, remember, remember how it was with... <laughs> remember how it was with old Abraham. Number one... He was old. Number two, Sarah was old. Number three, they had no kids. I mean, I think what Abraham was like 99 years old and Sarah was 90 years old. <laughs> and that, they were long past the time of having kids. I, I, you could try this now if you ever go to your church group and, and go to some ladies' meeting. And if there's a bunch of old ladies sitting around or even moderately aged ladies... And you tell them, hey, you guys need to start having some babies. Just watch them laugh like Sarah. Oh, they laugh and laugh. Th th that ship has sailed, Pastor. <laughs> they said, look out. That's what Sarah said. <laughs> but, so he's, but it says in, in Romans, it says Sarah's body is good as dead. Abraham's body is good as dead. They are, they are long past the capacity for having a baby and yet they get the promise in your seed in the, the child of sarah the world will be blessed this promise of abraham and sarah laughs it's so ludicrous but abraham hopes against hope there's no reason to expect a body from 
a baby from his body? There's no reason to accept to expect a baby from Sarah's body. There's nothing in their past. There's nothing in themselves. There's nothing in the in the things that they know. There's nothing in the technology. There's nothing in the history. There's nothing in anything that they can see that would give them any hope. Nothing but the promise of Jesus. And so they hope against hope. Now this this is the faith that you and I are called to. There's there's nothing in the in the news. There's there's nothing in the history of the world. There's nothing in your own flesh. There's nothing in the preaching of the devil that would tell us that Jesus is going to come back and completely remake this world. Completely restore this place so it'll be a garden more beautiful than it ever was to begin with. There's nothing that, that, that looking around that would indicate that. It looks like it's just devolving and falling apart. But still we have God's word. That's it. We have his promise. And so we hope against hope. In fact, in this way, we are, like Zechariah says, the prisoners of hope. That's what, that's what Zechariah 9 verse 12 calls the Lord's people. Prisoners of hope. We are bound to this hope. We are bound up to these promises. We are bound up to the life that Jesus has. Because as it goes with Jesus, so it goes with us. We see that Jesus did not stay dead, but that he was raised. He was raised from the dead. He left the tomb. And we have this same hope, this hope of glory, like Paul calls it in Colossians chapter 1. This hope that, uh, of Christ Jesus that Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1. We're waiting. Here's Titus 3, 2, 3, 13. Titus 2.13, that we're waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is our hope. Our hope is in God who raised Jesus from the dead. Our hope is in God who, who, who seated Jesus at the right hand of the Father. Our, our hope is in God who accepted the death of Jesus on our behalf so that our sins wouldn't be counted against us. Dear friends, we know that God is and that God is good and, and we know that he has made promises. So we wait in hope. We boast in hope. We cling to these promises. And we know that one day soon we'll see him. That, that hope will give way to sight. That we'll either close our eyes in the, in the sleep of death and waken them to see the face of Jesus, or, or else we'll see the face of Jesus coming on the clouds surrounded by the angels in great glory, and we'll lift up our head knowing that our redemption draws near, that our life draws near, that our hope draws near. And in this hope, we, we, we stay safe. Well, may God grant it. May God grant this, that, that we, you and me, that our families and our friends and our congregations, that we, would be, that we would be marked by hope. That the world would look at us and shake their heads because we are so hopeful that we would truly be captivated, captured by this hope and that we may abound. May the God of all hope fill you with this promise, with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you, you dear listener, may abound in hope. Hey, thanks for listening to Cross Defense. I'm your host, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church, and... Jesus Deaf Lutheran Church in Austin, Texas. If you want some more notes or some other stuff, you can visit the website, wolfmuller.co. I think we're confirmed. Wolfmuller.co slash hope has notes uh, for this show, and I'd love to hear more from you as well. Click the contact button. You can give us your feedback as well. And if there's someone that you think this would be helpful for, someone who's fighting to hold on to hope, I hope you'll share it with them. 
and rejoice together in these promises from Jesus. God's peace, God's hope be with you. Take care. Defense is a production of KFUO Radio. Find past episodes and support Cross Defense at KFUO.org. Thanks for again for downloading the podcast. I'm so happy that you are a podcast listener. Uh, you can help uh, the show spread. You can leave comments wherever you listen to your podcast. You can rate the show and leave comments. That helps other people find it. And if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'd love to. I, I really love hearing from you. Wolfmuller.co slash contact is where you can send all those notes. And, and remember, if there's anyone that you thought could be helped or benefited by this meditation on hope, I hope you'll share it with them and share the hope that the Lord has for us in his word. Thanks. Talk to you next week. God's peace be with you.